they don't need all the lip mo don't need all the lip motion and that stuff but <laughs> uh, superwoman over there i feel like i need to go to find me a phone book real quick all right here we go <laughs> all right good afternoon and thank you for joining us for our september legends and leapers program we are allowing people uh, into our virtual audience and we'll begin the program shortly. And this is where our theme music plays. Tear it up. All right. One thing I will say is if you guys get theme music in my short uh, brief absence, I will be very, very sad. Just gonna throw that out there. You gotta have theme song. Start it from the bottom. Now we're here. There you go. I like it. <clears throat> we really do need to create. Supposed one. to have one. Were we supposed to have walk up music? You, you were. You were. Oh, Maria's loving the panelists already. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Maria. We haven't even Hi, said Maria. Yet. <laughs> Well, good afternoon again. Once again, everyone, thank you for joining us for the September Legends and Leapers program. We'll get started by turning things over to Anthony Barnes, AMAC COO. Anthony? Hey, good afternoon, and welcome to AMAC Legends and Leapers program. I'm Anthony Barnes, AMAC Chief Operating Officer, and we're glad that you joined us for our September installment of this program as we continue our dialogue between industry legends and leapers. As AMAC is leading the change charge in advancing diversity and inclusion in the aviation industry, conversations like this are critical in exchanging ideas and gaining firsthand knowledge of the challenges and successes of our panelists. These inspirational conversations acknowledge the past created by our legends and they promote the next generation of diverse aviation leaders. As a reminder, you can view past discussions in the member portal of our website. If you're not a member, you still have time to become a member. You can join on our website at www.amac-org.com. And if you hear anything uh, throughout today's session that sparks an idea or a question for the panelists, feel free to drop it in the chat and we will get to as many questions as we can within the time frame allowed. At this time, I would like to turn the program over to our moderators for today, AMAC Board Chair, Mr. Ricky Smith, and AMAC Emerging Leaders Chair and Board Secretary, Lauren Mangum-Reed. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is so good to join you. I am here in sunny Savannah, Georgia, wrapping up another conference, and I should be getting on an airplane um, in a couple hours after this session, but it's good to join you. I'm excited again to have um, this panel. Um, we have Steve Pelham and Don Hunter, two amazing um, legends and leapers, respectively. Um, always good to join my capable, amazing, beautiful co-host, who's always trying to undermine me and take over, but that, that's old news, so I won't get into that too much. Um, but looking forward to a great session and, um, and um, great responses. So with that being said, um, Lauren, why don't you take it from here and, and do your part of the job? I don't know what's gotten into you, if it's sunny Savannah or what, but those was like that was like three compliments in a row, and I don't know how to feel about it. I'm really warm and fuzzy right now, Ricky, so thank you. Um, <laughs> I just want to shout out Anthony, um, our, uh, our, uh, in, with that introduction. It was so professional. I thought he had a prompt in front of him, and there was like a full uh, team over there that now I feel like I didn't come, you know, prepared enough for, for what Anthony started off with. It was so formal and so professional. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, Ricky, I'm excited. I'm excited because we have two amazing um, panelists today. Uh, Steve wanted to be the leaper. Um, I told him that I think Ricky's older than him, so he can have that for this particular mm. segment. <laughs> but he is the legend. <laughs> this regard and we have Dawn Hunter who is our leaper. Super excited. So I'm going to just uh, take a quick moment and tell you guys a little bit about our panel today. So Steve Pelham is uh, not only is he an at-large director uh, for the AMAC Board of Directors, he's the vice president for Jacobs Aviation Americas. 
uh, Steve leads the Jacobs America's aviation market, providing strategic advisory consulting and project delivery oversight service services to clients and aviation project teams. Leveraging more than 30 years of experience in airport planning, environmental design, engineering, architecture, security, program management, and construction management, he delivers solutions and services to respond to clients' challenges. Steve supports international, domestic, and military airport projects of all sizes and levels of complexity across the United States and around the world. Steve's commitment to and passion for aviation has driven his long-term involvement in numerous professional organizations focused on the latest technologies, project approaches, best practices, and emerging issues. Steve has participated in various committees uh, with the American Association of Airport Executives, which we all know as AAAE, Airport Council International, ACI, both North America and Asia Pacific organizations, and Airport Consultants Council, ACC. He is currently the member of the Aero Club of Washington and serves on the board of ACC, ACI World Business Partners, the International Association of Airport Executives, AMAC, and Tony Jenga's uh, Distinguished Aviation Society. Woo, all right. And you're gonna make me come after this? <laughs> well, Dawn, I mean that Steve is leveraging more than 30 years of experience and you're only 30. I mean, it makes sense, right? <laughs> you guys, if you don't already know, this woman needs no introduction. Dawn Hunter is not only the chair of the AMAC Foundation Board of Directors, uh, but also aviation commercial management for uh, the director of aviation commercial management for Seattle Tacoma International Airport. Uh, Don was first hired at the Port of Seattle in 2017 as a senior manager of airport dining and retail at Seattle, a transformational leader. Um, Don established strong partnerships both within and external to the port. She led the final phases of the dining and retail redevelopment at the airport to increase options for travelers and expand access for small and local businesses, which is adding more than 50 restaurants and shops at Seattle between 2019 and 2021. Um, just last year, um, Hunter and her team opened over 20 restaurants and stores, such as Lucky Louie's Fish Shack, Poke to the Max, Skillet, and Elliott Bay Book Company. More women and minority-owned businesses operate at the airport than any um, time in their 71-year history. As Director of Aviation Commercial Management, Don will implement um, an integrated strategic plan to drive sustained business development at the airport, including airport dining and retail, rental cars, parking, and ground transportation. She develops sources of non-aeronautical revenue and capitalizes on new business opportunities while representing the interests of her tenants and business units when developing policies. Ultimately, Dawn cultivates and leads a critical part of the airport economy. Prior to coming to the port, Dawn worked uh, for the uh, city of Los Angeles, Los Angeles World Airports, we all know as LAWA, as the senior concessions manager and as a security manager in LAWA's credential center. As a senior concessions manager at LAWA, she identified new concessions opportunities within operating terminals, worked with other departments to set goals and develop initiatives for increasing small, local, and minority business participation, and provided input and direction on concessions master plans with key stakeholders. Dawn also holds her master's degree in public administration from the National University and a bachelor's degree in criminology from Sonoma State University. So don't let Dawn fool you. Uh, that bio Whoever that wrote that, thank you. <laughs> I don't know who that was, but thank you. That bio is extremely, extremely impressive. Um, and we are just excited to be able to dig a little bit deeper and get to know these two uh, a little bit more and, and, and uh, all that they have brought to not only AMAC, but to the aviation industry as a whole. Do I get the screen, Do I get the screen back? Do I, get, do I get the screen back now? I, I didn't know yeah. when to jump in. You have about five minutes. Okay, I mean, because we're 10 minutes into the program and Don's been on the screen for like seven minutes now. So, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, Lauren was, so I don't know when to jump in. It's uh, not my fault. They are both bad, like bad individuals. You heard those bios. I'm just like- Oh, that is true. That is true. That is true. So let's put those, um, those bad individuals to a test. So as you know, uh, 
those of you that have that have been on the um, show before, we do not provide the panelists the questions in advance. And so these questions come from anywhere. As a matter of fact, we were saying in the pre-meeting that I had not even thought of the questions yet. So what we try to do is ask questions that will just get the speakers to think, because we know you guys don't come to the session to hear my questions or Lauren's questions, or maybe Lauren's questions, but certainly not my questions. You really want to hear the panelists. And so our goal is to just get them talking um, about something that um, will cause them to kind of dig a little deep. So the questions may be a little quirky sometimes. Um, if you see one of the panelists kind of look their eyes up in the air, then you know we got them where we want them. We got them thinking. So the first question is going to be a little somewhat of a softball. Um, so we've gone through this pandemic thing now for almost two years. I think we're 18, 19 months in now. And um, I mean, you've got to be an expert at it by now, right? Because we've been living with it for so long. Um, so can both of you tell me, um, what is it that you learned from this pandemic that the audience probably would not expect? Wow. Um, Steve, I will let the legend go first. I love this part when you two. Um, <laughs> My mother would be upset if I didn't allow the lady to go first. Oh, boy. What is it that I learned from this oh, Ricky, pandemic? Ricky, a curveball. That is a definite curveball. Um, I would say what I've learned from this pandemic, I mean, first of all, the pandemic put us in a position where we were all at home, kind of slowed down, gave me an opportunity and others to watch CNN every day and watch the news every day and really slow down and see what was going on in the world. And I didn't realize how crazy things had gotten in this country until the pandemic hit. Because I was always so busy running around, going to work, running to a meeting, and I would come home and just crash. And I had an opportunity to really sit and be still and watch the world unfold all around me. And I really thought, how did we get here? So I think the thing that I learned, the biggest thing I learned from COVID is that there are a lot of crazy things going on. And if we're not paying attention, it just happens around us, you know? I'm, I'm quite certain that if we were all functioning like 2019, when George Floyd was murdered, it would have just been another thing. It wouldn't have gotten the attention that it got, but we were all there watching him take his last breath because COVID told us to go somewhere and sit down and pay attention to what was going on. And so I would say for me, that was just the biggest thing. I got to really see what was going on in the world and processing it and having time to really have dialogue, a meaningful dialogue with people about what was happening. Uh, and the other thing that I learned from COVID is that the amount of human compassion that this industry has for one another. You know, there were some folks that were on the other end of it saying, I don't care, there's a pandemic, do what your contract says. But then there were this, this overpouring of people saying, how do we come together as community, as this aviation community, and how do we help each other get past that? And I don't think we contemplated going into year two, people, so let's get it together and, and do what we need to do. So I'm tired of wearing masks, but that's my other PSA at a different time. But um, I just think it just showed how resilient we were as an aviation community to be able to come together and support each other in very meaningful ways. Um, so I'll leave it there and I'll, I'll let Steve reply. You know, I know I'm gonna lose the eloquence award. Uh, yeah. Don, that was <laughs> nice. The uh, people like to see and interact with other people. And I think one of the big learnings is it's easy to hide during the pandemic and say, well, I'm not going to talk to anybody. But then to Don's comment, you start getting lonely. You start feeling alone. Yeah. And if we didn't reach out and try and touch uh, friends in the aviation industry in our own community, heck, there's folks that live five miles away from, from me that I didn't see for three or four months. And, and just touching people. When, uh, when George Floyd, of course, uh, occurred, was murdered, felt really alone. And uh, it was actually some really neat, courageous conversations that we had within Jacobs and had within our community, albeit teams, that uh, made us feel like we were still human and to hear some of those things and, and say, hey, there are folks out hurting. How do we help and support? How do we have some empathy? How do we, how do we get better? And uh, while yeah, there was a lot of hate uh, I also heard a, a really good human spirit to say we can be better. 
All right. Okay. That was good. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit and I'm going to ask another one of those quirky questions. So, um, so Steve, you're wearing the, you're wearing the label of um, legend here, right? And, and Don, you're our leaper. Both of you are extremely accomplished, but once someone has to be a legend, someone has to be a leaper. So what I need you to do, Steve, and what I need you to do, Don, is Steve, I need you to think back on your career um, and then put yourself in Don's shoes and advise Don as to what she should do to advance her career. Um, and then Don, I want you to do the same thing for Steve um, from a slightly different spin. Um, um, I guess since Steve is already there, um, what would you have done um, differently perhaps had you been in Steve's role? Wow. I think my question is harder. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you. I'll give give you some tips along the way. How's that on on okay. your uh, I was always told. I, I my parents immigrated, uh, and they started over here. And I think part of it was you got to. You can't get respect in, unless you give it first. And the only way I know how to give respect is to be curious, to listen to folks, their background, where they've come from. And if I just stayed in, in where I was at when I, I began out of college, um, it would have been totally different. Uh, I had the opportunity of getting involved, of being curious, asking what I could do to help. And I knew that by helping or supporting, being curious, then, uh, then good things would happen. And I think that's, that's rang true. So even as a legend, uh, I'm still pretty gosh darn curious. I guess it's my turn. <laughs> um, I, I too was raised by immigrants, so like shared experience. And I just remember um, my grandmother always told me, if you work hard and you treat people right, um, you'll go far. And that has always been the philosophy that I live by. And um, I think that is what Steve has lived by as well. That's why he's gotten as far as he has gotten. And um, and I would say to people, if you're if you're in a certain place and you're looking, how do I move forward? I think you take the curiosity that Steve talked about, and you take hard work and ethics and treating people appropriately, and you're always make it to the next level. Because it's, at the end of the day, it's not what you know; it's how you treat people and the relationships that you build, and you'll gain the knowledge along the way. Um, so that would be my response. So I will tell you this, both of you are very good. One of the things they teach you when you go through media training is regardless of the question that they ask you, you always take the opportunity to put the answer out there that you want. Okay, so thank you for taking that question and making something of it. So the, the third question that I have um, before we turn it over to Lauren or before Lauren butts in, um, and this is probably the more important question, um, just thinking about the, the, the significance of AMAC and the future significance of AMAC. Why is it more important that people recognize me as the primary host than Lauren? <laughs> oh boy. I, I don't want to touch that one, but I, yeah. Well, I would have to say as the foundation chair in which I have to be led by Mr. Ricky Smith, it's more important for us to listen to him so that I can get my needs met on the foundation. Oh, wow. I love you, Lauren. It's fine. Don just texted me and said it's all lies. She looks. I, <laughs> I, I didn't. I wasn't expecting that answer. I thought she was going to follow the woman who had tracked and so so some we know, sisterhood. We know the truth, Steve. You're on the hot seat. Sorry. Could you repeat the question? Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he can. I don't think he remembers it. I don't want to remember it. <laughs> and you know what's funny, Steve? I'm gonna I'm gonna bail you out here. I was just about to give Ricky a compliment and everyone that's on here that has has um, been tuned into Legends and Leapers, you know that is very few and far between, um, like it never happens. I was about to give Ricky a compliment about how Savannah um, looks good on him. You know, he came with some great questions, very profound, very eloquent. 
two things that he normally does not um, exude. And I was just really impressed, but it just, it, every, every good thing has to come to an end. So I guess that was it. <laughs> so guys, a um, couple things. I think that, you know, we talk about, you know, we're always identifying or seeing, when we see people automatically, we look at the differences, right? And I just found two similarities between the two of you. Um, I don't know if you're both first generation, um, as far as the United States is concerned, but both of you are, are, are your parents both were immigrants. I know, Don, your Panamanian background, Steve, tell me a little bit more about that. But how has that, you being first generation, how has that, um, kind of had an effect on not only your upbringing, but how you've gotten to where you are today. Dave, you wanna go first? Yeah, I'll take a stab at this one. So uh, English immigrants, uh, my family was still all back in England. Uh, a couple of cousins in the US, but uh, I didn't know about guns. Uh, tell you the truth, it wasn't until about 15 years ago that I. I learned about the migration of a lot of great families from the South up to the Midwest and the Northeast. Had not a clue. So there was a lot of things that I thought was, I was pretty worldly about from being a, an immigrant son to there was a lot of good core fundamental things that I just totally missed growing up in California and had no idea. So uh, go back to the curious, go back to everybody has a different path and uh, we can learn from them all. Um, like you said, my, my, my family, Panamanian background, my mom went from New York to California. So I was born and raised in California and uh, in Los Angeles. And how it brought me here today, like I said, my family just had a strong work ethic. It was like, you work hard, you educate yourself, you can do anything. And, it, and I appreciate that approach. Um, but it's also a detriment um, because in America, I'm a black woman, you know, and I was raised like a little Panamanian girl and all my friends were Pan or Central American. And the thought process is different. And understanding race and treatment in America is completely different. So as I'm walking through the workplace, I'm like, yeah, I'm educated and I'm a hard worker. And then you come across some of these um, uh, racism and some of these other things that I, you just weren't raised with. And so how do I transfer in my mind becoming an advocate for folks who are being treated a certain way or not having opportunity when that wasn't really the experience I had growing up? And I would say to all the people like me who, because I, for me, if you're first generation, it's just like you're raised in another country, but in America, because your thoughts and how you're raised and the food, everything is. And I would just say to, to folks like myself who are first generation or immigrants, really try to step outside of yourself because you know um, the issues that people deal with in America are so different and we have to be more sympathetic and put it in a cultural context uh, that we can be more understanding and how I'm able to advance um, you know women and minority businesses because I understand the climate here in America is different and that there are things that um, people face here that we have to challenge and force and something that may not be offensive or bad for me in this cultural context is offensive and bad. And I got to deal with it. And so um, I think that's kind of where it's propelled me today. And, you know, my parents were always big um, advocates of helping those who could not help themselves. My dad said, you have to be the voice for the voiceless. And so I've really taken that to heart to my detriment. Sometimes I need to be quiet, but um, that's just the way I was raised. So hopefully that answered your question. Hey, Lauren, if I may. Yeah. Take, take Don's comment, uh, the next step, because I, I don't know this, but my guess is Don's going to say absolutely. As a first generation immigrants, kids, when we go back abroad, we're much more sensitive to how Americans are perceived. And most of the time, it's not good. Yeah. And so when we go abroad, I hate being that uh, obnoxious, tacky American I want to, be <laughs> to, the, to, the, to the communities that we're in and the countries that we're in. And I've tra traveled all around the world. And it's interesting to put folks at, at ease to say, I'm not always, I'm always an American, but I have a perspective unlike most Americans. 
And uh, that's, that's served well in travel. And uh, those of you who have had the fortune of traveling international, uh, you've probably sensed that as well. We come across very those entitled. Were, those were two amazing, amazing answers. Um, far more important than any um, follow-up question we could do. So let me, um, let me kind of shift a little bit um, and then Lauren will probably jump back in for another question. So um, if you look at your, your careers, I mean, both of you are accomplished already, right? And you don't get to uh, experience the success that you're experiencing without making some pretty tough decisions with your career paths, taking some risks. Can you talk a little bit about the, that career move? Maybe you have one or two career moves that were the riskiest moves that you've made um, and why you decided to do it. I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll start with that one because that, that one's easy for me. Um, like I said, I was at LAX about 19 years. So I thought I was going to retire there, liked my job, didn't think I was going to leave there, sunny California. And then I got a phone call that changed my life. I got a call from a headhunter that said there's an opportunity in Seattle. And I said, no, thank you. I don't ever want to live in Seattle. I'm happy. No, thanks. And, and she was pretty persistent. She's like, well, can I at least have your resume? Gave her my resume. She said, they want to interview you. I, I told you I'm happy here. Like I have my little job. I have my routine. I'm good. And, um, but like Steve talked about the curiosity comes out in you and, and they kept asking. And so I came for the interview and I was myself because I had a job that I liked. So I didn't think I needed to impress anybody. And I kept thinking, these people think I must think I'm crazy. They're never going to call me back. And they called me for the second interview. And I just kept saying no. And then one day the stars just aligned and all my reasons for saying no kind of went away. And I'm like, well, I am curious, you know, you know, could, could I go down there and can I make a difference? And so I just said, yes, um, I'll do it. And I didn't do any preparation. I didn't have a place to stay when I got here. I didn't even think about it. I stepped foot in the city of Seattle when I moved here because I would fly into the airport and fly back to LAX because it was a two hour flight. And it was probably the craziest and most riskiest thing that I've ever done, but it has had the most rewards for me because I didn't overthink it. I just went with it. And I'm like, you know, every day was like a new adventure for me. And um, because I didn't overthink it and I just jumped in, it per personally, professionally has been the best decision that I've ever made in my life. Um, it was scary, but uh, I, like I tell my daughter, if you're not uncomfortable, then you're not growing. And so I had to be uncomfortable because I was comfortable for 19 years and there was very little growth within me. And, you know, I became uncomfortable and then, you know, the fruits of the labor come after that. So. And you got the chance to work with the amazing Lance Little. Of course. And that's, that's the cherry on top. That's right. Okay. I, I think I'm about to throw some bait out in the water and, and I'm not sure if Lauren or, or Ricky's going to get it. Uh -oh. <laughs> I came out of college and I got a chance to work for a company that was really big in training and development, uh, was privately held, uh, owned by a billionaire family. And I thought that was, this is really cool. It dawned on me about nine months later, damn, I'm in the carpet industry. <laughs> so 35 years ago, actually it is 35 years ago, I joined a carpet company and was trying to learn about floor covering. And I got the chance, one of my first mentors helped me understand about aviation and about airports, carpet for airports. And then I got into sports and carpet for sporting arenas and stadiums. And I took that worldwide within, within Millican. The funny thing is the big jump was, how the hell do I get out of carpet? So I spent almost 20 years with them and it was a headhunter, similar to Don, uh, and then Grice might be uh, listening. And he usually called me and said, hey, I'm looking for somebody that does this and this. And I said, Grice, who can I help you with this time? And he says, this one's for you. And I jumped off of uh, 19 plus years, privately held, did really well. And I went to a startup bomb uh, and threat detection company after 9-11. And what was the key? Aviation friendships, aviation relationships, and understanding how airports move. 
and uh, to go to your family and say, hey, I'm, I'm throwing away 20 years and I'm jumping on a startup. Good job. Wow. That so. never happens. That never happened. That that moment of that happened twice already, Ricky. First off, it takes a lot for you and I to be like silent. Um and <laughs> also just kind of that, that moment of wait, what? Um that wow, wow. You I, too, no, are y'all sure to say I'm, I'm, I'm trying to on I'm trying to honor London. I mean you. I, I'm just I'm I'm just impressed because you're we're throwing curveballs and they're just like knocking them out the park like bring it on to the point where i just i feel like we need to elevate our game ricky we need to step I, it up i was trying to figure out a joke that i could come up with that would call steve a carpetbagger but i couldn't find one <laughs> you still have <laughs> <laughs> so lauren you or me I, I'm, I'm I'm sitting here just impressed. Um, I've I've been listening to a series called Crazy Faith and talking about being uncomfortable, right? And just taking those leaps and hearing the two of you and your stories and your backgrounds. I mean, you you come from your lineage has taken a leap, right? When your parents came to America, they took a leap and look where you guys are now and the leaps that you guys have taken to get to where you are is just absolutely phenomenal. So um, I was trying, I was also too trying to find um, some jokes to pull from Steve's story, but then he ended it with a bang and I'm like, I can't talk about him now. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, everybody in my group who knows that I used to do carpet, they still do. <laughs> That's awesome. So um, question. Go ahead, Ricky. So question, um, both of you are, um, both of you have families. You've talked about the, um, the impact, the role of your families in your life um, earlier. You know, and, and I know the typical answer is I, I don't, right? I'm kind of like, like um, Dave Chappelle. I can give you the punchline up front and then tell the joke later and it's still gonna work. So I know your answer is probably gonna be, I don't. Um, the question is, I mean, how do you achieve work-life balance? <laughs> I'll let you take that one, Steve. So, yes, I'll agree with you, Mr. Chappelle. I don't. <laughs> uh, I've got a, uh, and my kids have heard this, and my wife's tired of hearing about it. If I go lopsided in any one direction, I'm off balance. So I try and, uh, try and work hard, put a lot of time in. I try and give as much as I can in the community, and then uh, also serve my Lord and Savior. And so if I have those three things working in harmony, and that might be a lot of time, I'm in good shape. Uh, part of the reason I give what I do within aviation, that helps me balance some of the other things. So when I get out of balance and I find that, whoops, you're not volunteering as much anymore, um, it, it doesn't work. And it, if I'm not performing at work, is that because I got bored? Is that because I'm not challenged anymore? And then the same thing at church. If I'm not given there, am I am I shrinking? Uh, Don's earlier comment: If you're not, if you're uncomfortable, you're not growing. So, uh, yeah, take that one, Chappelle. All right. Just surprised, Steve. I don't know you because I feel like I'm looking in a mirror and talking. We're. I just felt like we just have so many shared life experiences, but. Um, I'm glad you put it that way, because at first I was going to say I don't, but it, you're right. If you're doing the things that are important to you, you know, um, one thing that I do miss is when I lived in California, I was very involved in my church. Like if I wasn't at the airport, I was at church or I was, you know, and because of that, we we're doing a lot of community events. My father fed the homeless. We never had Thanksgiving dinner at my house ever because we fed the homeless every year. And I used to like I grew to resent it. And now that my dad has passed, I miss it. I'm like, well, I, sh I need to be out there doing something. And so I think when people think about work-life balance, it's like, oh, you know, do you have to do you take time off? Have you traveled? Do you have a boyfriend? Have you did and those things, it may be important, but they're not all that important. For me, the balance is doing the things that I love. And people always say, well, Don, you could say no. But I figure like this, I, I, love, I love to serve and in service, it makes me happy. 
And yeah, I get stressed out and I get tired, but if I'm not serving, because that's what we're here to do, we're here for service. Um, and did I sacrifice? Yeah, I have, I'm a single mom. I, my daughter was an airport baby. I drug her all over every terminal in LAX. She went to every meeting. I was telling someone a story about this other day. I was in a meeting in maintenance at LAX and we're talking about a drain. And she's like seven and she's like, oh my goodness, mom, you've been talking about this drain for over a year. And then there's silence on the call. And the guy was like, that is a shame. We have been talking about this drain for over a year. And it ultimately got fixed because she called us all out on it. But I just think when you're doing what you love, it's not work. And I love the airport. I, I mean, I, I don't see myself being in any other industry, but the airport industry. I love service. Um, I like serving a church. I, I just love it. And if I'm able to do all of that, then I'm happy. I think for me, um, when I'm sitting home bored is when I get in a, a lot of trouble. So I like, I need to stay busy to keep myself out of trouble. So I'll say that. All right. Yeah, Ren Camacho said that servant leadership is critical to work-life balance. Um, and up until five minutes ago, I never really looked at it that way. Um, so for you guys to put that in perspective makes so much sense. Um, and just the balancing of your lives, right? And, and everything that, that you do and, and the, be, the ability to be able to give and your feel as though, you know, that's fulfilling enough. Um, I, I just, yeah, I'm, I'm like, Ricky, I, I, don't, I don't know what's happening right now. Steve's like, bring I, it on. I just, I <laughs> you know, can I, can I add something, Lauren? Yes, please. This, so this panel's a little cocky, you know? <laughs> we should have known when Dawn left the screen one way and two minutes later came back, like, complete transformation. <laughs> should have known then, Ricky, and I, uh, we did it. And that's where we went wrong. And Steve's perfectly coiffed hair. I, uh, I, yeah. We it, got it. It. His hair is not falling out of place at all. Even no, no, no. It hasn't moved. It's it's taped down very well. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Don was about to say something. Yeah. You know, I just I wanted to add something. I you know in this industry there's been a lot of conversation about like and in, in a sense we have a legend and a leaper on here about secession plans. You know, and I was just thinking about that as I was listening to Steve's comments as well. It's I would say to people on the call who are thinking about you know. What's next for me? How do I become a legend or a leaper? You know, I look, I just do my job. So I appreciate the accolades, but for me, I'm always just doing my job. But I would say you, you really need to think about it. What is it that you really want out of this life? Do you want a job where you show up from nine to five and then people leave you alone till you show up the next day? Or do you want a career, something that you're passionate about? And when we talk about this whole work-life balance and I had to really ask myself, Don, what is it you want out of all of this? And I ultimately told myself, I want a career in aviation. And to have that career, these are the sacrifices that I'm going to, and, and now after we had this conversation, it wasn't sacrifice. These are the choices that I had to make in order to have this career, right? And so, you know, I, and when you make those choices, you have to be happy with them. And I've been happy with them thus far. And so I would say to people on the call who are really thinking about where they want to go next, what is it that you want to do? Do you want to have a career where you are feel fulfilled and you're doing something that you love or do you just want a job? Because that'll dictate how this all plays out for you. Um, you know, and I think that transformation from LAX here is I had a job that I turned into a career because I was there going through the motions and then now I'm fully involved and really understanding what my role is in aviation. And that's to transform the industry to make it better and then when I leave, I can pull somebody up next to me to say, hey, here's the reins, take it even farther uh, than that. So I just wanted to add that perspective to it as well. That, that's amazing. But you know, I thought I was competing with Lauren. I, Don, I think you're the first panelist to ask your question and then answer it. <laughs> that's how I roll. I see, that's how you roll. <laughs> so I have you another know. question. Go ahead, Don. <laughs> Go for it, Lauren. Go for it, Lauren. You know, you know what, Ricky? <laughs> I appreciate that because that actually brought me to a great question. Now, Dawn, I have I've had the opportunity to meet your daughter. She's absolutely amazing. I feel as though my daughter is going to be a little aviation baby as well. Um, real quick, Steve, how old how old are your kids? Good question. 27, 24, 21. 
Wow. Okay. So we, Don just mentioned succession plan and, um, you know, we, we talk about our, you know, you guys are first generation, your families have come here and just done phenomenal things and produce phenomenal people. Um, are your children, are, are they in, um, or have they, has your experiences through the aviation industry kind of, um, had an, had an effect on them? Are they, are they in this industry? Do they have an interest in it? Or are they like, I want to be completely in the opposite direction? Tell me a little bit about that. Good question. So all of them like using my points. How's that? Uh, <laughs> they, I never get to use my points, but the family, they, they use them well. Uh, I had one son, I do have one son, Jonathan, uh, who worked at AAAE for a summer and got a little of the bug. And then uh, he started working for uh, a U.S. Senator. And now he's uh, looking to further his career in the uh, uh, with an MBA, and he's talking to some of the airlines. So uh, that might be there. I think the greatest gift that uh, Sarah and I have given our, our three kids is love, uh, a little bit of a leash, and uh, the fact that they can all communicate. They all speak well. Well, you've met my daughter. She has her mother's personality. It's, you know, it's interesting when you're talking to yourself sometimes. You don't realize how annoying you can really be. Um, but um, my daughter, she, like I said, she's an aviation baby. She's just at this point in her life where she's like, I don't know what I want to do. And it is, you know, it's a trouble for me because, you know, I come from a family, you work, you, and she said, like, mom, I've been working, watching you work so hard. I don't know if I want to work that hard. I'm trying to decide if that's the life that I want. And, you know, I, I have to take a step back because I, my mother came to me like, what do you mean you're not going to work? You know, like, but I, I have to give her space and grace to come into her own and find her own path. Um, and so I look at it more like she's one of my employees. Some of them know where they want to go and you can help them get there real quick. And then there's some of, I just want to sit in this position for the next 15 years and be okay and take care of my family. And you got to be able to adjust uh, based on where people are at. And right now she's just at a place in her life. She's like, I'm over it. I'm watching you work hard. And I don't know if I want to go there, but luckily for me, I have an AMAC family. I got you and Maury and all these people who are, Hey, Caitlin, what's, what's going on? What are you doing? And I just love that because of course the mother daughter relation, Lauren, after a while, you know, nothing, you don't have any sense, nothing you say makes sense, <laughs> but it's lovely to have a group of people who can take your daughter and say, look, you know, and and let, let me mentor you and mold you and move you forward. And so she has that. And I really am thankful to the people on this call and the people that my AMAC family have really embraced her. I'm so, taking um, Absolutely. So, um, you know, I can't go to a conference, including the conference I'm winding down here um, without um, talking to a female that has an interest in becoming an, an airport CEO um, or maybe frustrated over lack of opportunity or the lack of progress there. Um, and so I don't want to waste this, um, this session without bringing that up and just hearing what you guys think about it. So, I mean, um, first of all, why is it so difficult for women to become airport CEOs and, and what should the industry be doing about it? Well, I, I'll, I'll speak as one who that is my ultimate career goal is to be an airport CEO. Um, you know, there was a point in time I was a little disheartened and then I, I you know, I had the pleasure to work um, at LAX and uh, work with um, Deborah Flynn and then with Cynthia Guidry and, and watch her growth. And so I'm getting more excited about this because these are two women that I know and I respect tremendously. And I just think it's opportunity. Um, it, it's, it's opportunity, you know, you read my bio, but I'll be quite honest with you is that if Lance Little was not the aviation managing director of Seattle Tacoma International Airport, I don't know if I would have been extended the opportunity to be at the director's table, even though that I'm qualified to be there. And, um, I just think that we need more men who are at the top of these organizations to really give us an opportunity to, to, for, to learn, for you to be, to, to be taught, and then give us opportunity to grow 
and move up. And I just think that there is a movement of more men in power who are uh, wanting to empower women and give us an opportunity. And I, I just think it's all about timing and opportunity. And if we're given the opportunity, um, we can shine. And, and we have several examples of that. And I, I don't know if Cynthia's on the call or, or if you know uh, Deborah's on the call, but those are two women I see who have done it because they were given the opportunity and are amazing at what they do. Um, and so I think what we need to do is change that. And there needs to be some, maybe there's a, there's a training that happens within an AMAC. I don't know that takes people and say, hey, you know, this is your skill set. You need to know more about operations and, and maintenance and certain other things so that once you, so you can propel to that. I don't know what that answer is, but the people in the position like yourself, Ricky, you know what that answer is. You know what it took to get there and then providing that leadership and mentorship to women like myself who wanna to get to the next level. So that would be my answer to that, Steve. You know, great, great question. Uh, probably realized four or five years ago, it ain't about me. It ain't about uh, what my path was or is. And if I didn't leave this place a little bit better than, the, than I came into it, I failed. Yeah. And uh, the more that we can do to give those opportunities, to give that mentoring, we've got some fabulous uh, uh, female uh, directors. We have some fabulous minority directors. And I think we have to keep giving that opportunity. Uh, and if they're not qualified, why not? And what are we doing? And so we're, I, I've got an emerging leaders group within Jacobs that I'm really proud of. I've got uh, a, a group that we're working on inclusion and diversity within aviation. And I don't always like being the, the white guy in front of a presentation. Uh, we've got to be better and bring others through or uh, I've, I've failed. So as, as we go into the, the women's side of it, if somebody was to approach me and say, hey, I'd like some guidance and some, and some support, one of them would be, come walk with me at a conference. Uh, let me go in and introduce you to my friends. And uh, how do we help? get a little bit more confidence? How do we help get a little bit more well-roundedness on all the things that directors uh, are to do? And I'm gung-ho for that. And by the way, some of the, it's not your question, but Lauren, it was about to be your question. When I, when I came into it, that's a question again. When uh, at 53 years old, why the heck did I start going to AMAC? And why did I say yes to Ricky to come on the board? And if I can't go and make a difference and Ricky allowed for that opportunity to, to become a reality, and I think it'll be a good payoff as far as a multiplier thereafter. And uh, anybody who's watching, and I, I know there's some good friends watching, and there's some friends that I don't know yet, but at AMAC, I got to tell you, and Don, you mentioned it earlier, you go to an AMAC meeting, it's hugs. I've been going to ACC for 30 years, love ACC. I don't get that many hugs. I've been on the AAAE for 30 years and a lot of handshakes, not a lot of hugs. AMAC is hugs. I got a hug from Ricky the other night in Savannah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's part of the AMAC difference and we got to keep pushing. Well, um, um, first of all, uh, two other, two amazing responses. Don, Cynthia is on. Um, oh. She's part of the reason why I brought it up because she and I had that conversation a couple nights ago over dinner with a group of people. So um, um, thank you so much for that response. Um, so it's 2.49. This is where Lauren um, comes in again. So be ready. She's back. I was going to say, Ricky, even little London over here is impressed with all of these answers. She just, Armada said, hopefully she'll be calm during the, during the uh, Legends and Leapers. And I think she's, she's very impressed with both of you guys. Um, Steve, you talked about it a little bit, and I kind of want to stay on this, this path. So for those individuals, Don, you talked about the representation, right? And Lance being in the position that he's in that kind of gave you a little bit more vision and also gave you the opportunity. Steve, you talk about pre having presenting opportunities within your organization. Individuals that want to move up, and, and I know we have AMAC builds as far as um, um, uh, the, the mentorship program that we're launching the uh, leadership program that we're launching and also the internship program from a high school perspective that we're launching as well. But for individuals that are on this call right now, what are things that they can do to put themselves in positions 
to move up within the industry and, and move up um, as far as either where they're at or into different positions within the industry? Is that a me first? Go ahead, Steve. Yeah. So uh, AMAC Speed Dating. So I met uh, Ortez at uh, Centuri. Uh, AMAC Speed Dating, that's how I met Al Edwards and CERM. Uh, I love those things, post. And one of the things I learned about the speed dating was it wasn't just about learning about new companies, about learning about new folks. So uh, my door, my phone, my teams, cell phone, FaceTime, whatever it is, LinkedIn account is open. Uh, if, if you're sitting, stand up and let us know how we can uh, help out. Cause it's hard for me to help you if I don't know that you want one help and support and, and how do I help mold and shape and direct you. I think piggybacking off of what Steve says, you know, um, especially women and women of color, we need to be open. You, you got to be open to meeting people and then op open to taking in the feedback. It's not personal. You know, it's not there to, to, to tear you down. It's there to help you see things about yourself that you may not necessarily see to make you better, you know, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, talking to my daughter is like looking myself in the face. Sometimes you don't get to see how you're interacting, how you're speaking to people. You know, you know, I'll, I'll tell people, go to conference, talk to people. And sometimes I'll watch some of the some of the people who work for me. I'm like, hey, you know, I was noticing this interaction. So, you know, maybe this might be better. And sometimes we get so defensive when people are giving us feedback that we're not open to the experiences that, you know, we could potentially have. You know, if, if I'm meeting Steve and we're starting to get to know each other, we're at a conference and he comes back and says, hey, Don, you may not be getting to where you want to go because I've noticed X, Y, and Z. Embrace that because there's 50 other people who saw it and didn't say anything to you. You know, so the fact that people would take the time to give you feedback when they don't have to, the time that the fact that someone would take time to really want to make you a better person, embrace that. And um, I just find sometimes as, as women, especially women, come, we, we come in the room sometimes with a chip on our shoulder because we already know, you know, they don't think I'm qualified. And, you know, I have all those things in the back of my head. And sometimes we have that on our shoulder. But sometimes you got to take that chip off your shoulder, come in, be open, be vulnerable and be willing to accept help from people and take in that advice and not take it and be so defensive with it and, you um, and really embrace what people are telling you so you can get to the next level. And that's what's worked for me. I had to let go of some of those preconceived notions of me walking through the door and what people would think about me because I'm a black woman. And I, I, I take that away and I just come in and be open to whatever opportunity is there for me. I see Anthony got back on. That must mean it's time for us to be quiet. You know the story. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, thank you, uh, uh, Ricky and Lauren, for leading us through the conversation. And thank you, Don and, and Steve, again. Uh, we actually did have a, a question that came in, not through the chat, but um, a question that came in asking about what inspires you uh, in your position. So we'll start with uh, Don. Uh, what inspires you to do what you do uh, in your position at the airport? And uh, follow up with Steve. I think that's easy for me. What inspires me is when I, I can grow a business. Like we, there was a business at LAX. They started off as an AC, small ACB business. By the time I left um, LAX, they had been purchased by a large prime for seven million, uh, several million dollars. And I was just like, I saw you and, and, and to nurture and encourage someone or a company and see them grow and get bigger and better and able to outbid primes and win contracts. I take a great sense of pride in that because I, we're here, as we talked about, to serve. We're here to make people better. And if I'm not leaving you in a better place when, I've, uh, when I leave, then, then my work was in vain. And so what inspires me is making things better and leaving things in a better place. Steve? So uh, my initial answer used to be for years, I love watching airplanes take off and land. I love being on a plane and do that, but I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to reach out on a little bit more. There's a lot of folks who, what inspires me is probably those who took the time to mentor me. Uh, and I think within this group, Eric Potts, Al Edwards, Gabrielle Mack, Seth Johnson, Shanetta Griffin, 
uh, Brad Mims, uh, folks who inspired me. So how do I in turn now get inspired? How am I doing it for the next group? And, and, and how do I do it for the next group that's really diverse? That's inspiring. Thank you. Actually, Steve, you, you took our next question that we had, which was, uh, who are your mentors? <laughs> so you've answered that question. Uh, thank you for that. Don, if you wanna uh, chime in, or Steve, if you have anything else to say about your mentorship relationship, or Don, if you'd like to. Well, we can announce now, though, that the next Legends and Leapers will be moderated by Steve and Don. Because <laughs> <laughs> We found my maternity leave replacement. There you <laughs> go. There you go. There you go. So, Don, um, um, mentors. Um, you know, my family. I mean, they—they've really the women in my family has really have really modeled what it means to be a strong woman. You know, they get up, they work hard, they take care of their families. Um, you know, they—they they do all of the modeling for me, and so that was laid out before me. But then also, I think just looking, um, you know, industry wide, there's just been a lot of people who've encouraged me along the way. And I would say those those are the people who are my mentors that said, you know what, you can do it. You know, don't give up, be encouraged. And of course, I have to give a shout out to Mr. Lance Little, who is the most amazing airport director that ever lived. I just have to say that. But no, he's it, it's it is good to work for someone who encourages you and has the same values as you. And it, it really inspires you to do more. And I've had the privilege of, of having that along the way. I work with Gina Marie, Deborah Flynn, uh, now with Lance. And I've always had amazing uh, people to work for that have the same value system. And that's so important because you can do great things when you are not fighting your boss or that you are working in tandem with them, so. Thank you. So I think we're just about out of questions. Um, I'm not sure if we're doing our, our uh, after show, but uh, stick around after. Uh, but just wanted to thank our panelists again uh, for speaking. Uh, thank you, Steve, and thank you, Don, uh, for your contributions to today's program. Uh, thank you, Ricky and Lauren, for leading us through this conversation as always. Uh, announced on this call, uh, we have made the announcement of our AMAC Builds program. We uh, want to make sure that our membership and uh, even those who aren't members to take advantage of our AMAC Builds program. We have our, our link that we dropped in the chat. Uh, we also invite you to join us uh, for next month, our Legends and Leapers program on the last Wednesday of the month on October 27th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, where we'll continue the conversation with our, our other legends and leapers in our industry. Um, and visit us, visit our calendar on our website uh, to see other industry events, not just AMAC events, but AMAC events, but industry events that uh, you can take a, uh, take a uh, participate in as well. Again, thank you for joining us. Have a pleasant day. So Dawn, um you got you got some fans in the audience. Uh, Castina is trying to get some brownie points. I have to shout you out. She said, as an employee um, of Seattle that works for Dawn, I can say she is awoken and provides a space for growth as well as opportunities. Um, so I, I wanted I wanted to make sure that you saw that. Uh, so Castina may be asking for a raise after. <laughs> But it sounds like both you and Steve are just doing a phenomenal job of just, you know, the, the door has been open for you guys in so many different opportunities and making sure that you guys are not just opening the door behind you, but putting a hand out and a hand up as well. So kudos to you all, because uh, everyone clearly loves you both. And I see, I see why. <laughs> Looks like somebody has a, Don, do you have a hand raised? Do I? Yeah, I was confused. I'm, I was looking for the yeah, hand as well. Okay, sorry. I, I was asking because because during the show you didn't um, you didn't think to raise your hand before you <laughs> before you asked your before you asked yourself questions. That's all. I'm just <laughs> look. Dawn, Dawn, Dawn was playing one on one with herself. She passing herself the ball. Up there, dunking it. <laughs> no, when I listened to the responses, then it just made me think of other things. You guys That's are so a skill. Silly. That's a skill, Don. That's yeah. a skill. <laughs>
Who else is, is going to give you the best answer but yourself when you ask the question? I, I, I love that this whole week Dawn's been leading up. She's like, okay, this is the question I'm going to ask. This is the answer I'm going to give. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, I was fearful because I'm like, well, what are you guys going to ask us? And they said, we're not telling you. And yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know what to expect. So. And look at you. Knocked it out of the park anyway. Knocked it out the park. And then some Christine Fom. Hello, darling, from San Diego. Oh, my goodness. I miss your face. Uh, she said uh, hello to everyone. And just thank you. Uh, greetings from much love from San Diego International Airport. Uh, so Cynthia, we're going to we're going to call out Cynthia really quickly. So I, it was Cynthia, right, Steve, that told you she had answered the questions before. Okay, so there was a set of questions. We want everyone to know this. We talk about this all the time. There was a set of questions, but Ricky and I purposefully never have asked the questions on that set of questions to the point where Charmaine doesn't even send it out anymore. So we didn't want to set you up because we had Cynthia, my, my analogy is we had Cynthia studying for the LSAT and then we threw the MCAT at her. And so she... <laughs> She had to be on her toes uh, when when coming with the answers. But you guys, I mean, I am just I yeah I, I I'm speechless, and that never happens. Look, we had look we had, we had one panelist that actually had prepared remarks. <laughs> oh no, we were not going to let that happen. <laughs> and I think I think the prepared remarks went through the HR and the marketing. Yes, and right. Yes, and everything. <laughs> And they were like, wait a minute, this is not the script that I had prepared for this. Right. Um, so Steve, you talked about your one son. Tell me, tell us a little bit about your other two. So, uh, let's see, I, I had a, uh, a princess and then when I ended up having two boys, she became the queen and, and uh, they became the jesters. But uh, Andrea's 27 and, it, and directs a youth camp up in the mountains of North Carolina. Wow. And uh, uh, that's something she's always wanted to do. And one of those things where you say, go get it, honey. Uh, working two or three jobs uh, for probably three years after graduation before she got it. And then uh, my youngest, and uh, Ricky's gonna enjoy this. He's a, he's a senior at, uh, at Georgia and go figure how he's a bartender for three years, but he just turned 21. And so I'm, I'm still trying to figure out. Right. <laughs> oh, yes, liquor, I do appreciate that. Liquor laws at 19. I love it. I'm 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 a fan. Uh, as an alum, as an uh, alumni of Arizona State University, and I tell people all the time that I had a I got a certificate in mixology with my degree. I do appreciate uh, your son having that experience. Well, I know who to look for. Then next time we actually are allowed to get together. Yes, I got I got you in 2022. <laughs> And Dawn, your daughter, how, how, how old is she now? 22. 22, and she's still in LA. She's still in LA. She did not make it here in Seattle when the cold hit. Don't blame her. For real. <laughs> or, 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 or the rain. And I know Ricky, you guys, you guys know, I'm, I'm on like full mommy brain at this point. Ricky, Ricky has two and his kids are absolutely phenomenal, just profound uh, athletes. I still don't know where they get it from. Um, but you have a daughter that's deciding what school she's going to right now, right? Yes, and I I, I don't give them uh, accolades publicly because I use that to barter. You know, that sometimes I want them to do stuff. And so I use compliments to get stuff that I want. So um, so that's coming from you, not not from me. No, I, no, I have amazing kids. And yes, my youngest um, one, my daughter, Tony, um, who's a senior in high school is, deciding which school she's going to commit to um, for hockey. And so we're excited about that. And then my oldest son, I'm sorry, my, my, um, my son, um, Kobe, is a real estate agent. Well, I'm sorry. He's not a real estate agent. He's a realtor. So I'm told that there's a significant difference between the two. Um, and so he has put his, um, his hockey career behind him, and he's now out there, you know, hustling to make money and um, sell properties and buy properties and and do all kinds of stuff. So um, again, amazing kids and I love them to death, but I just don't compliment them publicly because I gotta hold on to those chips. That's fine. I feel as though I compliment them enough. Um, probably yes, you do. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just impressed in the fact that they were able to to do so many great things with their lives with you as their dad. You know what hey, I mean? Yeah, I knew it was coming <laughs> when I put <pumped> on. <laughs> all the it's barriers right. that they were able to break. I just, I'm just impressed, you know? So I got to tell you what a small world it is. 
uh, I was chatting with my admin in Fort Worth this morning and she said, hey, the propeller from the AMAC silent auction uh, is shipping out and it's all done and it's going to Don Hunter. And uh, I thought that was funny. I was like, well, I'm going to be chatting with Don here very soon. And Don, I had no idea, but thank you for your contribution to uh, AMAC by the purchase of that propeller. Oh, no, thank you. And I, call my, I just bought a house here in Washington and I call it the house that aviation built. And so I have a lot of aviation related things in here. So that'll be a lovely addition. So funny how small a world it is, isn't it? Yeah. Well, congratu congratulations, Dawn, on the new home. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So are you, guys still, are you guys still working from home a little bit? Are you guys, are you guys balancing out back in the office? How's that working right now with where we are? Well, I'm, I'm both, I go in as needed. So um, like today I'm home just cause it's raining, but for the rest of the week, I'll probably be in the office um, walking around. You know how it goes when, when mama's not out looking, you know, all sorts of things will start happening. So I just have to show my presence every once in a while. Like I'm still watching, still seeing what's going on here. So. I was gonna say Kalia's on the call. So she, she actually, <laughs> just play it. I know she's holding it down in your app. <laughs> oh yeah. Steve, what about you? So our offices are now 25% open and uh, on a hoteling basis. So when I'm home, I'm home. Uh, otherwise uh, I'm on a plane somewhere. That's awesome. So I, I have, I do have a quick question. I know that we talked about pre pandemic, right? Both of you guys are very well traveled. What is your favorite destination, favorite place? Let's say out, Domestic and international to go visit. Go ahead, Don. <laughs> oh boy, you're you're better traveled than I am. I, I would love to hear your answer, but I think domestically, I, I I I love New York City. I love it. I love the energy, and ironically, I, I didn't live there because I'm like I don't want, want to live anywhere it snows and it snows here. So I just kicked myself really hard on that one, but. I love traveling to New York. I love shopping there. I love eating there. I just love the whole energy of the city. Um, I'm getting older now, so it's too much, a little bit too much energy, but it's one place domestically I love to go. And then internationally, I'm reserved that one because there's so many places I want to go. Like next year, I'm going to Peru and I'm going to go home to Panama. There's a couple trips that I'm going to do next year. And so ask me that next year. <laughs> Because right now I haven't traveled enough to know where my favorite place is, but um, internationally. So, Steve, I'm sure you've been plenty of great places. Yeah. So when I was a kid, there was this um, uh, variety show that would come on at night. Uh, and the host was a lady named Carol Burnett. And at the end of the show, she would, she would start out by saying, it's so nice to spend this time together. And everybody knew what that meant. So it's so nice to have spent this time <laughs> together. Reggie didn't even let Steve answer his question. <laughs> Steve, I would never have done you like that, Steve. I just he just apologized you off the stage. And I just want to you know that I would have never done me. that to you. I didn't I I didn't know Steve was gonna answer the question. Go for it, my friend. It's all right. It's all right. So I would just say when you go to the Middle East. You learn a ton. You go to China, you learn a ton. Uh, but there's something about being back in my in the, in the family uh, confines of England. But if I got my family, I'm I'm in Tuscany. Yeah. So now now we see Steve had Steve couldn't have any more children because he only had so many points to divvy <laughs> between the three, and that's why he had to travel as much to keep everybody happy. Right. Right. Okay, now you can sing, Ricky. I'm done. It's so nice it to spend this time together. And I don't remember the, uh, the rest of the words, and so I'm going to stop right there. All I know is the end of the song she did, she tugged her earlobe. That meant goodbye. Well, with that being said, I will say that, Ricky, on the together part, you did, you sounded a little tone deaf in the beginning, but at, towards the end, I did hear a nice little 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 uh, cadence there. So I will give you a little compliment, but thank you guys so much for joining. Um, just, just a little one, one Steve, just a little it's one. the transmission through this virtual thing. That's something about Ricky being in Savannah, Georgia. I don't know. He's just, he's like a brighter, happier 
more positive person. I don't know what it is. Um, but thank you guys. Once I so said hi. Dawn, Steve, you guys are absolutely amazing. Um, I now know who I'm going to replace Ricky with when we finally give him the boot. Hey, so thank you both. You might not have to wait long. <laughs> Thank you both so much. I mean, just the, the commonalities between the two of you um, and just the energy and I, you know, Ricky and I didn't even need to, well, I, I of course was going to be here, but Ricky really didn't even need to be here because you guys just carried the show all on your own. So thank you all so much. Again, like Anthony said, please go check out uh, the AMAC website with AMAC Build. We have a lot of amazing um projects and initiatives that we're doing, including our inter internship program, our mentorship program, and also our leadership program. And if you've learned nothing from Steve and Don, uh, just take this away, take that leap, get uncomfortable, and really uh, go for those opportunities and, and be in a space to create those opportunities for yourself. So thank you all so much. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Outlook, our virtual participants are helping us with the song. It's so nice to spend this time together just to have a laugh and sing a song. That's all I know. They're getting thank contributions from the audience. Thank Carla for helping <laughs> Ricky. <That's> priceless. <laughs> and with that, with that, you all have an amazing rest of September. October's already here. Oh my goodness. You all stay safe, stay blessed, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Absolutely. It's called family, Ricky. Yes, it is. It's called family. All right. All right. Much love. Take care. Lauren. Thank you. Take care. I love you.